Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator. Let's talk a little bit about weapon speed, weapon initiative, and weapon reach. And there's a lot of confusion on this topic, I think largely due to gaming, both uh, video gaming, but also role-playing games and lots of related things. I've even seen uh, issues with this in wargaming as well, in uh, Warhammer back in the day. So, what is my gripe about weapon, uh, heavy weapons versus slow weapons, fast weapons, and weapon reach? Let's find out. But before I go on, this video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, which means you're not getting any other ads playing over this video. So, we're going to have a short interlude from them, and then I'll be back with the main content of the video. Raid Shadow Legends is an incredibly popular, free-to-play, on mobile or PC, turn-based, fantasy combat game. I play Raid regularly on my mobile, um, I really like the combat and I like the tactics involved. You can find me online as Captain Context of course and battle me there. Let's go into the dungeons. Ouch. Yeah. So the arena battles can be pretty challenging. Let's see what happens when you take on someone whose team is basically much tougher than yours. <laughs> Ouch. 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 <laughs> and that's why you want to level up your champions so you can take on really tough teams like that. And by the time you're watching this video, the brand new Tag Team Arena should be live in game. Tag Arena is the next level of competition PvP battles. Instead of a single 4 vs 4 battle like in Classic Arena, it's actually a series of three 4 vs 4 battles. It's the best of three. Whoever wins two battles wins the series. It's basically Arena on hard mode. And since it's brand new, the developers will be giving out some special rewards soon to whoever manages to finish high up in the rankings. So, if you're like me and you love truly competitive PvP battles with some big rewards, you're going to love Tag Arena. So please go to the video description below, click on the special links and if you're a new player, you'll get 100,000 silver, 50 gems, 1 energy refill and 1 free champion, the Executioner, who's a really great one for new players. This special offer is only available for the next 30 days and only for new players. You can find these rewards up here in the inbox, which looks like a treasure chest. So go and download Raid for free in that link below now, and I'll see you online for some battles. Thank you very much for staying with me. Now, so what is my main issue here? Well, this all stems, this video stems from, uh, I was reading the comments under some of my previous videos, as I, as I do, and I sometimes respond to them. And one of my videos that I did years and years ago was looking at the so-called Zweihander. In fact, it was this very sword behind me here. And it was actually a video looking at can a weapon like this be used in one hand? And the basic uh, summary is that yes, you can just about use it in one hand for certain certain things, okay? You can hold it in one hand, you can just about cut with it one-handed, uh, but really that's not how these weapons are supposed to be used. This is a big heavy weapon, it's about seven and a half to eight pounds um, in imperial measurement there, um, but it's, it is a big hefty weighty weapon and it's not designed to be used in one hand. That's the summary of that. However, what the person said was, uh, you know, they don't see why weapons like that ever could have been successful on the battlefield because someone with a much lighter, quicker weapon would obviously just run up and stab the person dead. So, you know, someone with a, a dagger that is regarded as a quick, we quick weapon or something like this spadroon or presumably rapiers and small swords and, you know, shorter, quicker weapons of all sorts. Now, there are some major, major misconceptions uh, there that we have to address. And really, the biggest one is, have you seen the size of this thing? Okay, so this goes all the way back to the uh, days when I used to do quite a bit of Warhammer um, Wargaming, and I used to do quite a bit of D&D &D, um, role-playing games. And it really, really bugs me when you have any sort of speed or initiative given to a weapon based on its speed. Now, anybody who's done 
any sort of um, sport, frankly, not even just martial art, but anyone who's done any sort of sport or uh, you know things like fencing or any kind of martial art will understand that just as important as how quickly you can move an object is how quickly can you get to the opponent. Now, quite simply, if one person has one of these and one person has one of these, yes, theoretically, I can wiggle this around more quickly than I can wiggle this around, although I'll talk about that in, in, a, in a minute. But as you can see, hopefully, hopefully this is clear on the video, one of these weapons has slightly more reach than the other one. And actually, when you want to attack someone, unless you're standing right next to them, unless you're in a telephone kiosk in a telephone box or you're in a very small room or you're sitting on you're uh, just, you know, sitting in like a toilet cubicle or something with them if you're right next to them then yes indeed this is going to have the advantage over this because you won't be able to use the giant weapon in a very confined space and that's why things like this exist but if you're not if you're fighting someone who is at a normal distance whereby neither of you can yet hit each other the person with the longer weapon just as George Silver said in 1599 the person with the longer weapon will generally speaking have the advantage because they get to strike they get to attack they get to do things to the other opponent before that other person armed with a shorter weapon can do anything back except for defend okay so this person can both attack and defend and keep moving back or moving around around and keep distance. The person with this is limited to only defending themselves or basically only charging in. Now charging in, what does that involve? That involves moving your feet. Now when you're moving your feet, believe it or not, the speed of the weapon doesn't play a very big part. Okay, If I've got a slightly uh, lighter and quicker longsword here compared to the big Zweihander behind me, I can only move my feet at pretty much approximately the same speed as the person who's holding that weapon. And it doesn't matter whether you're holding a 16 foot long pike or whether you're holding a one foot long dagger or knife. The fact is that your feet will move at the same speed. So if you have to cover distance to try and combat and fight the opponent, um, then that can only happen at a certain maximum velocity, okay? And therefore, the reach of the weapon is super, super important. So quite simply, the person with the longer weapon uh, has, has an advantage, regardless of whether it is slower or faster. However, when the weapons are of equal length or equal reach, then speed can start to be a factor. And so that is when we can start to look at is one weapon, say a rapier is roughly the same length as a, um, as a longsword. There's a rapier up there. Okay, rapier is roughly the same length as a longsword. If one was faster than the other, and I'm not going to say that a rapier is necessarily quicker than a longsword because it depends on the rapier, it depends on the longsword. Remember the longsword's gripped two-handed, and I'll talk about that in a second as well. Um, but if we assume that in this particular scenario the rapier is quicker than the longsword and they've got the same blade reach, they can strike from the same distance, then in that situation, in terms of the first strike, and only the first strike, because what happens after that might change, uh, how the fight turns out, but in terms of landing the first cut or thrust, um, indeed, the quicker weapon, when the measures, when the lengths are equal, will have a slight advantage, or will have a definite advantage, in fact, in landing that first hit. Um, so if we're talking about pole arms, for example, if we take uh, something like this fairly weighty bill here, compared to the spear, if we say that the spear and the bill are of the same length, or pretty much the same length, then this is a weightier weapon. So if we're at our maximum reach and we're stabbing at each other, generally speaking, the spear will have the advantage because the spear is a more nimble weapon of the same reach that can stab me quicker, it can parry and riposte, it can do things quicker at that reach than this bill can. So you might think, well, so what's the point in these heavier weapons? Well, that is a complicated topic. In terms of the comparison between the bill and the spear, I am giving up some of my uh, nimbleness and speed with the bill, okay, um, to have a spear, to have a specialized thrusting weapon. And so that is what I'm gaining with the spear is speed, nimbleness with the point. 
Um, and what I'm gaining with the bill is the ability to do other things. Why might I want to do other things? Well, quite simply, one of those reasons goes back, if we go back to what I was saying a couple of minutes ago, the first strike isn't always the last strike. In fact, there might be many strikes involved in felling an opponent or a number of opponents. Additionally, sometimes if the first um, strike or attack, particularly if it's a thrust, is put aside, so uh, if a spear is thrust at you and you do manage to defend against it, or if you have armor or a shield and it glances off that and you are closing in, at that point the spear is now at a disadvantage because it doesn't really have many other things in its toolbox. Yes, you can push the person away with the shaft, you can bring the back end in, you can run backwards to gain measure so you can thrust again. There are a number of things that the spearman can do to try and turn the tables back in their favour again, but fundamentally if that first attack doesn't land, then other things start to come into play, particularly when someone is closing in and closing distance. So with the bill, for example, um, if, if, the sp uh, if the spear thrust comes in and I do manage to defend the spear thrust aside, you will notice now, especially if I was moving forward, my weapon is now offline because I've defended with it, but I've now got the ability to chop or cut or spike back, or indeed to uh, hook their weapon. So you've got a bunch of other options. So uh, to summarize, this build sacrifices thrusting speed for an equal reach by being, and it is heavier, but it gains some other things. Uh, and against opponents, for example, armored opponents who might be uh, quite invulnerable a lot of the time against a spear because they're able to uh, cover their vulnerable points and close in with their sword, come charging in with their sword at you against your spear. If you had a bill, uh, they might knock, they might get past your point and knock your point aside, but you might have a walloping great uh, blow to their helmet as they come in, which gives you enough time to backpedal again and get your point online. So um, weapons are complex things; they're not simple, and it's not a simple uh, sort of rock paper scissors uh, equation. It's much more complicated than that, and um, sometimes what you lose in one respect, you gain in another. So bringing that back to the, um, uh, the two-handed issue that I was talking about. So sometimes how uh, heavy a weapon is doesn't always tell you how fast it is because you've got to think at how is that weapon used. So for example, a longsword is usually heavier than a rapier. Does that mean that the rapier is faster? Well, as I've said, it depends on the rapier and it depends on the longsword. But what you have to remember is whilst the rapier might be in literal terms lighter, it's usually used in one hand. Okay, the longsword might be heavier, but it's used in two hands, and that means that you've got more leverage on the weapon, and you can move it, you can power it in a different way, and you can actually get velocity into that blade by having twice as many uh, hands and arms on the weapon. Additionally, there is a question about how far apart your hands are. So if we go back to the um, bill for a second, you'll notice with the uh, two-handed sword or the long sword, you are more or less limited into how far apart you can put the hands on the grip. We won't talk about half swording here, but you're limited into how far apart you can put your two hands on the grip. Whereas with something like a, a bill um, or any kind of pole weapon, you can put the hands close and strike a horseman from a long, long way away, or you can bring the hands close together and your weapon now becomes shorter, but much more nimble. The final thing I want to mention as well is that there is a question of body motion and attacks. So very clearly, um, and this is also related to the topic about thrust versus cut, which I have covered in previous videos, but when you give an attack, there is clearly a spectrum, there is a range of different degrees of movement that your body could go through. So indeed, if you cut with a, uh, with a two-handed sword or a long sword, it could start from here, it could start from something like the uh, Zornhut or um, uh, Poste di Donna or some kind of guard that's very wide space and you move the entire sword and the body forward in a great big giant blow. Or it could simply be that. Now quite simply, the, the big extreme movement is going to have more force and more power behind it and might achieve other tactical goals such as forcing the opponent to uh, defend or move out of the guard that they're standing in that you don't want them to be standing in. Um, however, 
If we start with the sword in front of us um, uh, moving quite a small way, that might give enough of a cut to disable them or hurt them or distract them or something else, or even just a beat on their blade in order to create an opening that you can exploit and come into. Uh, but this small movement might achieve just as much tactically, but is a much, much smaller and quicker movement. So we can't really Talk about weapon speeds. It's something that really, really irks me in gaming systems. Um, the final thing I would say is I've noticed uh, recently in uh, gaming terms that certain weapons are moved unrealistically quickly. And it is fair to say that due to the weight and point of balance or center of gravity of certain weapons. It, if you have swung a weapon which has a center of gravity or weight which is fairly, uh, point of balance which is fairly far from your hand, you must take into account recovery times. And recovery time isn't always a direct straight line correlation to how quickly the weapon can move. You can move a Danax uh, pr uh, you know, fairly quickly, similar to a longsword, um, or a two-handed sword, but because swords are balanced closer to the hand, the recovery time or the follow-up time to your next attack might be much, much quicker with a sword than it is with something like a bill or an axe or any other weapon which has the weight basically at the end of the lever. So that's the other thing that I think games often get wrong, including... Uh, you know, including things like role-playing games as well, is that attacking speed, the initial attacking speed, something can be fast for the initial attack, but slow for a follow-up attack. Um, and equally, you might find that a weapon that you think of as quicker might be actually only the same speed with the initial attack, but it gets its speed in the follow-up attacks. And finally, I just want to reiterate that just because something's quick to move around in the hand, if it's short, that basically negates its speed advantage because it doesn't have a speed advantage because its reach advantage is so massive. And for anyone who's ever tried to use something like a knife or a dagger against someone with a longer uh, weapon which has more leverage as well, and those are kind of two different topics, but uh, anyone who uses a bigger weapon, so a, you know, kind of like a main battlefield weapon like an axe, or a long sword, or a bill, or a spear, or anything like this, uh, trying to use a knife or a dagger is pretty much hopeless unless you're already on top of the person, basically. And that's how those weapons were predominantly actually used, was at this point blank range, basically punching distance. If you're not already at punching distance, you shouldn't be trying to use a knife or a dagger against someone with a weapon that can hit from far, far away. Right, I hope that's been, uh, I hope that's made sense. I hope it's been logical and tied together. Thank you very much for watching. Um, give us a like and a subscribe if you haven't done already. And I will see you really soon again on Scholar Gladiatorial channel for another video talking about weapons and warfare and history and armor and all those sorts of things. Thanks a lot for watching, folks. Cheers. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.